right now we're gonna go back uh, into our session. Now, this is part two with Dr. Harabni, and I have Brianna Rodriguez, which is gonna take it, I'm gonna pass it to you, Brianna. Thank you, Pedro. Okay, Dr. H, so my question is, I'm sure you've had a student who is very off track, and how do you deal with that and redirect them while still allowing them to have um, their own success and ownership instead of just saying, you know what, move over, let me tell you how to do it so you get it right, and still giving them their own um, voice and taking ownership of that. Yeah, um, this happens more often than, well, actually, you folks are teachers, you, you know how often this happens. This yeah. happens a lot, right? Um, and this is a special opportunity. Um, and, and I start off with this premise. All of my students, even if they're just in for the credential, have some dream, have some goal, have some priority. And if they're off track with an activity or they miss something completely, um, I will try to find something good in what they have, comment, encourage, and say, listen, let's meet. And I meet. I will, I will bug them. If they can only do a phone call with me, I'll do a phone call, but usually I'll do, you know, some type of a web-based conference because I do everything online, right? So I, just for the, those who are taking this in, everything I do is online and I happen to be in another part of the country. And actually some of the students in the ADL program are in different parts of the world, right? So meeting physically, if I could, that'd be best. Meeting physically would be the best, but meeting, okay? And so meeting is so important. And that meeting is not about me. It's not about my assignment. It's not about what they did wrong. It's really about finding out where they are at. So most things are connected to the innovation plan. So in, in the ADL program, it starts off with what is your starting point? Where, where's your beginning? What is, you know, we, we need to have some starting point. And so we have to get clear on that. And sometimes that innovation plan was not clarified very, very well, or people had developed it thinking, well, I'll just sort of fake it, right? And then a couple of courses in, they're going, ah, oh, this isn't working. That's because you're faking it. So no, I, I don't say, see, I told you, you shouldn't be fake. No, I don't do that. <laughs> I, I remind, I encourage, I, I support, and, and I help my learner to find a way out of where they're at. It isn't me telling them what to do. I ask, I ask a lot of questions. What's your, what's your context? Where are you at? What are you doing? How does this work? And what are your options? And so it's a process of give and take. And it's letting them know that my job, my job is to help them be successful. I say that all the time. It, my job is not to tell them whether they're right or wrong. Oh, you didn't meet my criteria or standards. No, they're not my standards. Yes, I've got standards for what you need to do in the course. And you're probably all recognizing, I do expect an awful lot of my ADL graduates. You actually probably do a lot more than most other people do. You do. Yeah. I trick you folks by getting you to do real authentic learning opportunities. You do a lot more and the standards are higher, but the quality of what you do is amazing. You're going to be able to do this in the real world, okay? So when I work with that student who's who's missed something, um, I find out what it is that, that they have missed. Now, I also start with another presupposition. Chances are my instructions suck. Seriously, I, I, no, maybe I maybe I didn't explain myself well enough, right? It might be just a matter that a language issue. So earlier on in our conversation, I was clarifying the definition of terms, right? Sometimes I just confuse people. I talk too much, <laughs> right? So I, I listen, I ask, I find out where they're at. What do they really want to do? What's uh, what's their hope? What's their why? Why are you doing this? Most people go into a discipline um, that has an educational component because you're somewhat idealistic and you want to change the world. You want to improve things, right? So if I can get them to think about what it is that they really want to do, and I, I've had, I often have students from the business world. Well, in the business world, they want to make an impact. They want to lead an organization. They want to do certain things. So you find out what the why is. And then once we get clear on what it is that they need to do, we take a look at the assignment and where, what went wrong. And I try to help them understand what they need to do to take what they have so far and make that adjustment. Because quite often, it, it's a matter of looking at something, well, this looks like a glass. Oh, this is just a 
funny glass with a picture on it. Well, no, it's actually, if you change the perspective, this is a cup, right? So it might be just a matter of getting them to look at what they're doing from a slightly different perspective. Um, and it's a give and take. Sometimes it takes a couple of conversations. Sometimes it takes, you know, them sending me another iteration of their activity and their assignment and another video for, with me explaining, you know, this is great, this worked, you missed this part, right? So it's an ongoing iterative process of helping them to realize what it is that they need to do to be able to implement what they want in their circumstances. Um, now, do I dread this? Do I get frustrated with it? No, I actually like this because it allows me to interact. And there are times that I've had some students who recognize that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to, you know, to miss, a, miss, miss the target, so to speak. And that once they know that I am gonna allow them to redo stuff and well, just a grade, once, once the fear is taken away and that they realize that, that I'm gonna help them, it changes everything. So if I can move down that path and get them to recognize that they have an opportunity to change the world around them, Right. So take the focus off of uh, off of my standards, my criteria, but help them recognize their opportunity to improve their world, get them back on the track. So what is it that you can really do? Sometimes they have to shift the perspective of the assignment. Sometimes it's, it's looking at doing something completely different. I call it a pivot. Right. It, you know, it's whatever your real world authentic opportunity has presented you. There are times that I will. It doesn't happen often, but there are times when I let students know that, and this is why we put the 5305, the innovation course at the beginning of the ADL program. Um, there's an awful lot of work in this program and everything is based on what you're gonna be able to do. If you're not gonna be able to do something, if you're gonna be faking it continuously, it's gonna be a lot of hard work and you can do it, other people have, but it's this ongoing process. So you have a choice. You can either find something real to do or Maybe there's an alternative uh, perspective. So that that sometimes happens, um, not often. For the most part, I work, I struggle, um, uh, multiple resubmissions. But then once I hit that point where the epiphany happens, the lights go on, and they got it, and then they they run with it. I've I've I had one student. I made him redo fifty three oh five completely. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? He did a great job. And after that, it changed everything. It changed everything, right? He he took it seriously. So, because he was kind of blowing it off, blowing it off. I, you know, he it, it was he was he wanted to go through a simulation. It wasn't really important. So I I I have actually made people do that. I I if you don't do the work, I can't. You know the <laughs> uh, grades don't lie. You know I I. I yeah, and sometimes that has happened once, but he went on to graduate and do exceptionally well. And I've actually had him work on a couple other projects with me after the course, after the program was over. So it, it was wonderful. I took the time and I saw the potential that he had and, and I was willing to work with him and to help him to realize that potential. So it, it takes a lot of work, but it's, it's worth it. It's worth it because we all have a sphere of influence. And, and if, if, if I can get, help a learner to recognize that this course is all about, or this program is all about making your world better and, and doing something good in your world, it, it changes things. And it, it um, makes, it, makes uh, all the difference in the world. A lot of work though, but it's fun, it's worth it. Did I answer your question finally? <laughs> yeah, no, yes, you did. And I, um, you've mentioned that you always see yourself as a guide not not the person that has the answers and i think that has allowed me to take ownership of that of in within my classroom as well is no you have to do your work i'm i'm here to help you and i'm here you know let's figure it out together but you have to do your own work take ownership of that and you know it you end up learning more clearly but that that's a different mindset and shifting that because I think teachers are looked at as to have the, you, you're supposed to have the answers, right? Yeah, um, you know, I, I've been accused by a variety of students. Dr. Harapnik, you're not doing your job. You're supposed to be telling me what I need to know. You know, um, 
Yeah, I I agree. Um, a guide on the side, you know, that typical saying. I, I like the idea of a coach. I, I I like that. The coach, the facilitator, the guide, um, and and it, it, it's exciting because um, coaches can make a difference. Um, and and the the beautiful thing about the coach is that the coach isn't in the game they're not actually playing the game, right? That, you know, the, the players are in the game, right? But the coach can help the players be better, right? So, you know, think of, think of, okay, I'm, I'm a Canadian, so hockey, right? Wayne Gretzky, you know, the, one of the greatest hockey players, he had lots of good coaches, right? Glenn Sather was a coach of his for a while with the Edmonton Oilers, right? Sidney Crosby, again, one of the, one of the best players in the world right now with Pittsburgh, lots of good coaches. Alex Ovechkin, all oh, probably the most amazing Russian player ever. Lots of good coaches. Okay. So you need a good coach to help a good player to be even better. Right. And uh, I think it's wonderful because you, you can pour your knowledge and your insight and your capacity and let them do the hard work. Right. You know, cause uh, again, the gray hair, I'd love to be out there doing it, but no, it's better for the younger folks to be doing it. So <laughs> it, it. You have to recognize your role. And I think that's important. Now, this is important to understand that with outcomes-based instruction, where your students are building something real, they own it. Now, if if we were doing competency-based instruction, if I was dispensing knowledge and information, well, then I am the, the teacher and I am the authority, and you answer the answer the questions on the test. And so, it's a very different model. And um, I, I wish we had a little bit more of this outcomes-based perspective. Um, and we're starting to see pockets of it research. It, 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 we're, we're, we're into a pendulum swing right now. So like the timing for this has never been better. I, I am so thankful for COVID. Yeah, I know you're recording this and I hear I'm thankful for COVID. But COVID, I think, has helped people to realize that we can do a better job. And, and that's why I'm thankful. I'm not thankful for the horrible aspects that have come about, but I think this COVID situation has helped everybody to realize that people like me who've been living in this space for the last 30 years, no, we're not just an anomaly. We're not just that weird professor who does that weird stuff. No, if more people did some of that weird stuff, all the students would benefit. Yeah, still have the standardized testing. It's always gonna be there. But if you can sprinkle in a little bit more of the, that outcomes-based instruction, the coaching, the guiding, the mentoring, the facilitating plays a more significant role. And, and from, a, from a professional perspective, I think about how you feel, the difference, right? When, when you challenge one of your kids, yeah, listen, you need to do that. You watch them struggle, watch them struggle. Oh, oh you're tempted to step in oh, and then they get it. Yes. And then, and then they go, oh, oh. Miss Brianna, I got it. Yeah, yeah, you did. I knew you could do it. Oh, they're proud. <laughs> you know, that, that is why we do what we do, right? That epiphany, when they get it, uh, it's wonderful, yeah. And I uh, know, uh, Dr. H, you actually were able to look into the future because you just answered the second question that I actually have for you, which was about what are the challenges as a professor of letting go of those expectations? Uh, but you really actually uh, give us the answer so let me ask you this, like, when and how did you learn to let go? <laughs> the, the reason I'm pausing is that I, I, I'm going to go back to my personal life. Uh, when I had small boys, it, it became very evident to me, a two-year-old, me do, me do, me do, me, 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 right? When, when, you're, when your child wants to do it themselves and, and they need to struggle through and, and, and you realize you can't teach them how to walk. I did not teach my boys how to walk. I failed as a father. Well, I would argue that nobody's taught their kids how to walk. They have to struggle through it. Right, Brianna, Brianna's chuckling, right? You know, she, she knows, right? I, I, if you've been around kids, you've seen this. Okay, a language as well. Did, did I actually teach my boys how to speak? No, we immersed them in a learning environment and through being immersed in an environment, they acquired language and speech. They acquired a lot of social skills, some not so good, some better. <laughs> you know? So, you know, the, think about it, they had me as a dad. So there's, there's issues, there's always gonna be issues, right? Fortunately, they had a wonderful mom, right? So you know, thank God they had a wonderful mom, right? So um, I recognized earlier on 
with children. I also spent a fair amount of time, even before I had kids, I, I did work with kids. Um, I, I volunteered in schools. I had a niece I spent time with, and, and I, 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 I spent a year in uh, with her in kindergarten and in grade one in schools, reading to kids. And, and I'll never forget the experience of having one ratty, naughty kid that they gave to me because I was the only person who could sort of physically control him. I'd pick him up and hold him as he'd squirm around. I'd sit, I'd hold him down. I'd make him read with me. This is back at a time when we could touch kids a little bit more than we could do now. You can't do that now, right? But but again, I I disciplined him a little bit. I you know, I, I wasn't mean to him, but I just I helped him to control himself. But I spent time with him, and in about a month, I got him from not being able to read to being able to read. And and when it clicked, I was holding the book. When it clicked, I can do this. You know what he did? He grabbed the book from my hand tore it out of my hands and he he looks at it he looks up at me looks at it again he flips the page he's starting to read something else i can read right it's sort of one of those you know i i worked with him but he had to get it right i didn't get him there i i i was you know i did i did some discipline i was with him i read with him but i guided i coached him and then as he progressed, I, I was only getting in the way. I had to figure out a way to do things differently. Now, discipline was no longer an issue with this kid. And man, he didn't want me to go. I don't want to go, to, I don't, I don't want to go back to the class, right? He wanted me to hang around because he had an opportunity to grow. And so, okay, I'll be back next week or I'll be back in a couple of days. Don't worry, don't worry. And if I ever miss a day, man, it was just full. I never heard the end of it. Um, so I spent time with him. And then it was a matter of guiding and directing him after he had this basic capacity. He wanted to read more. He wanted to look at other things, right? He wanted to do other things. And so once you realize that learning is all about making that meaningful connection, the individual has to make that meaningful connection, you have to let go of that. You have to get your your learner to the point where they recognize that they are the learner who is making that connection. Um, it, it it's it's hard to do that because most of our systems of education are about preparing students for a test, are about regurgitating information, are about you know studying this, studying that. The the actual true problem solving other other than like reading is an amazing thing. Helping kids learn how to read that's an amazing thing because. You, you realize that 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 is something they do. You only coach and guide. You can you can actually speed up the progress or you can slow it down. Seriously, it, you know, it, you can get in the way. And the more you get out of the way, the easier it is for kids to read. Now, athletics, same thing. The more you get out of the way, the easier it is for a kid to learn. Now, you need coaching guidance and you need to be able to demonstrate. But at some point, they need to wipe out. At some point, they need to actually feel what it's like to, you know, get your fingers whacked by a basketball. That there is that ownership part that has to come into play. And so, when I, I I think you have to realize that it's not about you. You you have to realize that the learning is what the individual does, and you have to really shift that role. I I I I think I saw it with kids. I saw it when I was volunteering with kids. I saw it with my own boys, and then in you know, I, I've been working at a variety of different levels. I saw it when I was doing some uh, teaching in, in middle school and high school, but I think undergraduates, um, undergraduate students, I, I had my eyes open to the fact that um, these people are really great at taking tests and they knew nothing, but yet they could pass any type of a test and, and having conversations with them and, and helping them to make meaningful connections was um, was something that um, I enjoy doing. And when I shifted the focus about from me to them and I teased out the ideas, um, that's when I realized that's how learning really works. Um, also, my I, I, I was a kid who was quite dysfunctional. I had ADHD or ADD, whatever you want to call it. And, and I probably had a little bit of dyslexia, even though I read a lot. I had a, I had a problem with some certain things. Um, I've always been somewhat autodidactic and, and I've recognized that that capacity saved me. That capacity um, allowed me to be, or, or to get to where I am now, even though I, I was a high school dropout. I, 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 you know, the system 
didn't really work for me. And so when I went back into the system of education, I wanted to actually do things different for the weird cases, the people like myself who didn't fit the system, right? Because guess what? I think there's lots of us out there who don't really fit the system. <laughs> I think there's more than we, we let up, right? There's a lot of kids who can benefit from coaching, from guidance, from a little bit of caring, a little bit of attention. And so I think the big recognition is not about not about me, um, but seeing that in the early years and, and recognizing that if I can help somebody else make that meaningful connection, if I can create that right learning environment, if I can change my approach, if I can give them some of that ownership, um, let them make those choices, make do something real. If I can do all those things, then then that learning is theirs. Once it's theirs, you can't take it away from them. So I don't know if I directly answered your question, but it, 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 it took me a while to realize that. It took me a while to realize that. But there's nothing like seeing it with little kids, though. Whew, that's wild. Me do, me do. <laughs> me, 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 me. <laughs> yes, yes you did. You did, actually. You know, and, and that probably just refers to cases like me. You know, I've been in education, but I don't have a teach on my own. I mean, I don't have a child on my own. So I don't really go to those really baby steps and see like how amazing that is when they're like doing something so essential to life and something that, you know, it's just like I do without thinking. Um, so I just, you know, I definitely going to use that to, to encourage my teachers to see that relationship because uh, you actually answered my next question already, which was about, you know, the advice of solutions on, you know, how you actually let teachers to let go, loosen up. I, I have a little bit more for that. I, 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 uh, I did have the privilege of you folks sharing the questions with me, and I knew that that was coming. There is a little bit more. I, I think one of the best learning theorists that provides just some of the most amazing foundational research on this is um, uh, Piaget, Jean Piaget. If you take a look at, at some of his writings and some of his research, um, he, he, from a scientific perspective, identifies how important it is to create those concrete experiences where the kids engage in a real world way and that they build a foundation in that concrete authentic real world experience that then allows them to move into the abstract right so if you take a look at his you know he's 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 rec renowned for the levels of, of development right different stages of development but what a lot of people don't realize he actually it wasn't just kids he dealt with everybody the whole spec right up to adults um and and he looked at learning from a learning theory perspective and the key thing is is recognizing that the learning is what the individual does and and that they need to be engaged Right. And 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 so you, while you might not have kids right now, but you can read his work and he observed hundreds, if not thousands of kids. And so there is well established research. Um, I do have a post on my on my site where I point to one of my favorite uh, books. It, unfortunately, it's, it's a translation of his work because he did his work in French. Um, and that's the only drawback. That's why we don't not enough people are really exposed to Piaget because uh, some of the some of the translations aren't that great. But when you look at the body of work, the hundreds of research projects he did, the observations, looking at, at how kids learn and and uh, in that one post I have, I think I've got a half a dozen quotes where he is extolling this constructivist uh, perspective of ownership that I think is really important. And that would be a wonderful tool to share with colleagues, you know, to help them recognize that we are preparing people for life. Remember, you know, my saying, you want to prepare them for the test, prepare them for life. Well, guess where I got that one from? I got it from him, right? So, you know, th there's a lot of research out there that you can point to. Um, so even if you don't have that practical experience, uh, well-established peer-reviewed research that, that really points that. Seymour Papert, more recently, um, amazing, amazing work. Uh, Salinger, who was one of his pupils, amazing work in, in the uh, I'm, uh, makerspace movement. You've got a lot of people today who have um, a lot of research and a lot of wonderful books and ideas that are based on some of this foundational work that is traced back to Piaget and then, and then Dewey. And actually, you could trace it all the way back to the Stoics. <laughs> you, know, you could, like, you know, it, uh, but in the middle period, you'd have to take a look at the apprenticeship type of a model that we, we saw in the Middle Ages. But, you know, we're, we're humans. We learn by doing, by experiencing, by experimenting. And, and, and you know what? Encouraging your teachers, colleagues to 
let kids be kids. Let kids play. Let kids experiment. Well, actually, uh, adults like to play. Adults like to experiment, right? We do. Uh, that's part of our nature. And, and so helping people to become a little bit more childlike is a good thing. You know, so that hopefully that I think can be an, an encouragement and it, it's fun. It is fun to see some of the bizarre projects kids can come up with. Some of the things you see pe- kids create is just amazing. You know, where, where are their heads? It's just amazing. So it's, it's exciting. Hopefully I've given you some suggestions pointed to some ideas that you can find useful and encourage so, people to move in that direction. Dr. H, hearing you say that it really made me think about how clear it is to see that adults want to do these same things. Like if you go to like the Perot Museum, that's here in Dallas in Texas, um, but it's a interactive museum. And I've been to one in Arkansas. So I'm sure they're all over the country and the state as well. But you go and you see kids enjoying interacting with all these different science experiments and just moving things around and seeing how they work. But then you can also see their parents and adults doing the same exact thing, trying to figure out how it works and how what's happening, how it makes sense and kind of exploring with their kids. Um, I don't know. It just popped into my brain as you were saying that, that, you know, it's not just kids who want to be creative and explore, but really everybody at the end of the day. Well, it, it's interesting that you mentioned that up, up here in Canada, we have an organization called TELUS and TELUS has uh, innovation centers and they have them in different cities and, and they are like this museum you're talking about and you go there and you can do all kinds of different experiments and explore more adults go than kids. <laughs> and the only time kids go is during the daytime when, when schools take them on field trips but in the evening time kids can't go because parents have booked everything up or adults like it is an amazing place to explore to experiment to try different things um and i think it's a testament to part of our nature we want to create we want to explore we want to experiment oh it's fun take a look at at where we are in the world look at the amazing inventions you know we've we've got cars that can almost drive by themselves like a tesla is an amazing device sure unreliable and they might burn but still they're an amazing amazing device right like we, we had we had well, not spacex what, what was a group that went up um took a bunch of non-astronauts for three days and they came back down safe right we, we've got people who are talking about mining asteroids this is amazing stuff you know this is the stuff of science fiction but science fiction comes out of exploration science fiction comes out of this type of a, a world of what if <laughs> it's a wonderful wonderful way to be and i think i i always encourage here's one more thing you might have an, another tesla in your classroom you might have another einstein who knows who knows you might have a, a jonas salk you might have you know um an inventor in your room somebody might have a cure for cancer or something I hope. right yeah we hope we hope i heard something the other day on a podcast and and this is this is scary this notion that the world is being overpopulated is actually a misnomer uh, this researcher was arguing that um in the next in the next 30 years, the population will decline because we have hit a point we are no longer replacing the population. We are below, like it's 2.7 children per, per, per female in the entire world. We've dropped down to 2.4, 2.1. And in, in the US and Canada, it's something like 1.5. So we're, we're in decline. Even in China, China is changing their policy because they're recognizing they're in decline. And so there's a lot of researchers that are going, oh, this is not good. And the reason it's not good is that the more people we have, the more opportunity we have for people to be born who are going to have a solution to a problem. So as our population declines, our ability to innovate is declining directly. Right. So this this Malthusian scare tactic, oh, we're overpopulated, is actually not very accurate. Um, and if anything, in, in, there's a there's a whole stream of thinking that would argue that it's actually wrong in the sense that we need more people to be able to come up with a solution to the problem. Right. And, and, and there's a whole body of Hans Rosling. Um, he passed away recently. There's a whole bunch of people. Steven Pinker, um, Enlightenment Now. Right. There, there's there's. There's lots and lots of thinkers who are pointing to our amazing capacity for exploration and for problem solving, for growth. And guess what? That growth comes out of Brianna's classroom, your classroom, Colby's classroom, you know, Pedro's engineering club. What 
can you imagine what projects are going to come out of some of the work that you, you folks are doing? That's exciting. That is changing the world, right? That's exciting. Dr. H, my next question is, how long have you been constructing this uh, ADL or DLL course? And the follow-up to that is, well, what made you decide what to share with us for digital learning or for COVA? Okay. Um, I started research into this in the, um, I, I've been working with technology and education since the late 80s, 88, 89. I've been playing around with computers and technology and finding out better ways. In the early 90s, I switched from studying, doing a master's in philosophy to a master's of information science because I recognized that the connected world was going to present a world of opportunity. Um, and then I started building courses and I started to learn that um, a lot of instruction that we have in terms of the traditional behaviors perspective doesn't work very well for a world that is connected, that is almost unlimited, and that you need to sort of make it up as you go along sometimes. Sometimes you, you, know, you, you have to have a sense of exploration, right? And so I started looking at learning theories and I quickly found that um, the ideas of Dewey and Piaget and Bruner, the old constructivists and Papert, uh, the thinking machines by Jonathan was popular at the time. Anyways, that type of, that type of work got me going in the early 90s. Um, and then I realized that there wasn't a system that was available. So I figured I was going to build my own. And I started building courses and online courses. And my first online course was in 94, fully on 95. And then I did research into this idea of creating a learning environment and then immersing people in the learning environment and then um, helping people to change their thinking about learning um, in my doctoral research in, in uh, 96, 97, 98. So that's, that's what you're experiencing started then. Um, back then it was called inquisitivism, the hmm, what does this button approach to learning. Um, so it, it's, it's grown and it's matured. And I have taught courses that have a lot of these elements of choice and ownership. I've been using authentic projects in all of my instruction since the 80s. Okay, so that, that piece has always been there, which means choice has always been there. Um, the ownership has always been there. The voice is a newer perspective. The voice is a newer perspective that comes out of my research into, well, <laughs> so when I was doing my doctoral work, this is serendipity. When I was doing my doctoral work, I was, I'm a technology guy. So I was playing with Unix and a variety of other things. And in faculties of education, they didn't know where to put us technology people. So they put me into ed psych. So all the ed tech guys or the educational technology guys went into psychology. And so I was in psychology, educational psychology, and, and our the university I was at was heavy in, on the counseling side. And so I took a lot of psych, a lot of psych. And so I started to take a look at that effective domain and, and the psychological side of learning that I hadn't looked at before. And that really opened my eyes to learning theories, right? And then, and then I had already been looking at you know, the learning theorists like Dewey and Bruner and Piaget. Um, and I started to make those connections that we need to combine the authentic learning opportunities with a little bit of psychology and, and you know, and the whole cognitive side, because I was in a school that emphasized the cognitive. It was a cognitive school. So our, our school was known for its cognitive psychology. So I was, a I was a constructivist in a cognitive school who was playing around with technology. So I didn't really fit anywhere and I had to make it up as I went along. So um, the, the voice part came out of that when I started taking a look at the work of people like uh, uh, Misero, right? Um, and his whole idea that you don't really learn something until you tell somebody else about it. Or Albert Bandura, oh, Albert Bandura, amazing work. Amaz he's a psychologist out of Berkeley. And, and he, uh, he's responsible for a lot of cognitive behavioral theory, um, things like that. So a lot of people who, you know, if you look at a lot of CBT stuff today, you'll find its roots in, in his work that he did back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. So I, I saw that element there. And I, I had a foundation in the older theorists uh, like Dewey and uh, and Bruner and Piaget. So all this happened. And then in, in the early 2000s, I started building courses, graduate courses. Well, I'd always been teaching grad school and undergraduate courses, um, but then I started to build a programs around this. Um, and in 2006, um, six, seven, I started to build some 
kind of the innovation course. I, I did workshops on the innovation course. And so a lot of a lot of what you saw in the ADL program came out of the work that I was doing in the early 2000s. And then by about 2010, I had about six or seven of the core courses that you have experienced some variation of built, but in other contexts. I, I did work in other schools and I taught them in different programs. And they were all online. And I had worked at other institutions. I had lived in the US, I was in Europe. I, I, I lived, I traveled and I taught online. And so I, I made the argument that um, I was a better online educator because I actually walked the talk. Most online educators really didn't know what it was like. You know, they didn't have a computer at home. They went to the office, they connected to the computer. Yeah, I'm an online educator. No, you're not. You, know, you need to live this, right? So I live this. Um, and so all this came about. Um, and then in 2015, um, I had an opportunity to come to Lamar, 2014 actually, and build a whole program from scratch. Um, and so it was the realization of my whole dream of what I was working on for the last 20 years. <laughs> so um, th what we built originally, the digital learning and leading program, um, I, I am responsible for nine of the 12 courses in that program. I, I didn't build them all. I, I, there's some other people who are involved. Obviously there's, there's, it's a collaborative endeavor, but a lot of the philosophy. And then, so the whole, the whole notion of giving students choice, ownership and voice through authentic learning opportunities was built into the program because what we wanted to do was um, offer students an opportunity to be exposed to a true constructivist learning experience true constructivism, not this, not we lecture, tell you how to do it and then go and do otherwise. Well, we had to model it. Okay. So I had to model it through living it. I had to model it through my own portfolio, which I have, I, you've experienced it. I had to model it through uh, the experiences, everything I do, creating the videos, some of my earlier videos, you've seen some of the earlier ones, eh, not so good, but some of the older ones, oh, you should see the one in 5320. Oh, I'm getting really slick now. Maybe a little too slick. <laughs> I think I might have to dial it back a little bit. I think I have to make it more accessible. Anyways, the point I'm making is that I have been looking to continually improve and refine, and I'm constantly analyzing, reflecting on how can I make it easier for my students to take and create an amazing learning environment for their students and change the world one learner at a time. I, I've been living this dream consistently since the 90s. So the, the DLL was the first big program uh, of this sort. I, well, I built one other program that was smaller, but this was, this was a, the full-blown masters. And I had done parts of other doctoral programs, but the DLL was the first big one. Um, and then when we, when we were looking to move to the ADL, I had the opportunity to go and change things that I really was disappointed about. Initially, the DLL was going to be 15 week courses and it would it would take yeah, 15 or traditional semester based courses, right? Because repetition over time when you're doing real projects, it's a lot of work. But because of marketing, I had to squeeze it into 5 weeks. And so um we did. We cut out a lot of stuff that was unnecessary. Um and then when when the opportunity to do the ADL came about, the the discussion was going to an eight week format, which was almost as good as a 15 week. But you know what, since I squeezed everything into five weeks, eight weeks was even better. And that was a sweet spot. It also allowed me to eliminate some stuff from the program that was unnecessary. And what I've been finding over the years is that good instruction is about getting rid of unnecessary things more so than it is adding more. Okay, so if you create an environment where your learners are building real projects, what you need to do is you provide the resources at the right time and you point students to the right resources as they're going along. That's the key. More isn't always better. Lots of stuff at the wrong time is useless, right? Now, having exposing students to an idea initially, repeat it here and then repeat it there. Well, that's important because they have to grow. So if you think about some of the perspectives in terms of your learning manifesto, the learning philosophy, how do you apply it, right? If you take a look at the growth mindset, re you revisit it a few times, right? This whole idea of the purpose, the why. Well, you also take a look at it with Wig's wild and portly goal statements, your, your results statements with the influencer model. So this, this purpose, this goal, why do you do what you're doing? You're, you revisit these ideas. You were introduced to that in one of the intro courses, right? So we've got a little bit of that repetition that allows you to be exposed to an idea, massage it, work with it, and then uh, make it even better. Um, 
we were constantly changing things. I'm constantly going back. I, I don't, do you folks realize um, in, in the assessment um, as learning piece, um, you probably notice this when you take a look at the instructions for this latest course that I added a component in your reflective piece. What worked? What can you do better? Oh, I, 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 this what can you do better question. The reason I put that in so that people wouldn't give themselves 100%. Because <laughs> if you can identify something you can do better, then you might give yourself 99. I, I, I don't mind people giving themselves 100%. And the students who I have experience in doing that deserved it because they worked like crazy and the work they did was amazing. But I'm always concerned that I want to develop this capacity to always be better. So if you give yourself 99, that's great. 100 but if you identify a few things that you can do better well and you did a really good job on that that you know i'm always making adjustments constantly i'm always looking at what's happening with the program if i get a bunch of emails about something or if i'm, I'm looking at assignments um i'm making an adjustment uh, recently in, in the organizational change course i took a look at my instructions i reread them again oh man you know sometimes my instructions just suck they're terrible right that you know i i and and so i i'm go i have revised certain instructions for better clarity right so i'm always looking to improve so to answer your question about the adl and and where how did it come about and where are we now? I think the ADL is at the point where I'm just finishing up the, the, uh, the last two courses in, in, the pro, in uh, redevelopment of the last two courses. And I shot the videos for the capstone course um, yesterday morning. I'll be editing them later on this afternoon uh, instead of marking assignments. But anyways, uh, so I've, I've got five more videos to edit and, I'm, I've, and I've got all the other pieces ready to go and that, that course will be there. And um, it's been refined, it's been honed, I've deleted stuff. I've added a couple key videos here and there. So it, it's this ongoing iterative process. And the constant driving factor is I, I want to make it easy for my learners to be able to be successful. And, and if I can get out of their way, uh, the, the better it is. And then if I can provide that key question, that key video, here's a, here's a key article to read at this point. So I, I wanna be there at that right time give you the information you need or see that information maybe a few weeks earlier so that when you hit a struggling point, you go, oh, I think Harapnik said something about, okay, where, what was that? Oh, here it is. Oh, oh, here, I can use this tool, right? So it's really looking at where my learners are at and responding to their needs. Um, and the reason I have to do that, I'm an expert in this area. I've been doing this a long time. I suffer from expert bias, I do. And I don't always understand how it is for my learners. And so when I'm seeing struggles, when I'm getting emails or I meet with people, it, it isn't that they've done something wrong. I, I kid you not, my first reaction is, did I not explain something? That's where I go first because it's on me, right? So the ADL is sort of a, a process over the last 25 years, right? And and um, and you folks are making it even better. Just think of what you folks did to me in the first couple of courses, right? Um, I didn't even think about combining the, the two assessments together when you do the accelerated version, right? So I, I'm always making adjustments. You did that. I, I think, well, Allison and uh, Allison, there's somebody else. There was a couple of people who commented on that. Allison started it. She starts a lot of stuff. I think maybe Pedro was involved in that too. I think you all were. You all ganged up on me. No, but it was good. When I say ganged up on me, no, you didn't. What you did is say, well, you know, Dwayne or Dr. H, this would be better. I think this would be more effective. It would help us if we could do that, right? And, and the other thing that is really important, um, and, and this is really about the ADL, I'm trying to let go of more instruction and give you even more freedom. Right, I, I'm really, really working at that. So, Brianna, you and I have had conversations. Well, should I go to this? Should I do this? You're struggling between different platforms. So, what did I? I didn't make it any easier for you. Well, it's your decision. I weigh out the pros and cons, right? But I, I just coach and guide, um, and and that's the ADL, the applied digital learning. You're applying all the digital learning ideas that. That, that I'm exposing you to, to your own circumstances, to your own e-portfolios. And then more importantly, which I'm seeing you do, you're applying it to your own learning environments with your, with your students, right? So that's where we are. Um, the, part of your question was, um, 
yet another part how how did i decide what to do at what point or how much to, can you maybe clarify that part or did i answer that I, I no you did to... you did um just what to share with us but no you did and you answered the second one already was um how are you still changing things which you actually mentioned earlier in the um segment that we sparked another light bulb or something so oh. it's really always changing yeah, it is. Um, I actually use those midterm diagnostics on a regular basis to make adjustments. And um, the uh, now I'm going to let you in on an administrative trick I learned. If you change more than 25% of a course, you have to go through a, a formal process. Hmm. Formal processes are a pain. But if you change up to you know 20, just below the 25%, you don't have to go through a formal process. <laughs> Uh, that's why I'm constantly changing stuff. I'm constantly improving it right now. When I do it, I documented it. And then in the documentation process, in terms of uh, credentialing and standards, um, you know, we, we have, we have regu regulatory bodies that the School of Education has to um, respond to. So I document all the changes that I make on a regular basis. And so that when we, when we are assessed, I'm one of the, our program is one of the few programs that doesn't get raked over the coals because we're continually improving it. Most other programs, they build it, they let it go, they don't do anything. Now, I'm feeling a little bit bad because in this past year, I've sort of let the DLL stuff stop. I haven't been improving that because we've got the new program. So there's a whole year of kind of old courses. So in one sense, I have been going back and editing a few things, but I haven't radically improving the DLL because right now, wherever I can, I move students into the ADL. So whenever you've got a complete program shift, you have this, this situation. So, uh, but what I have been doing is that I, um, I've been I've been giving students access to courses ahead of time and information, and I'm doing whatever I can to help students finish up well and finish up strong, um, and, and and do those sorts of things. So, um, it it's uh, it's an ongoing iterative process, and um, it's exciting to see where we're at. I, I'm I'm at the point now where I joke around about this. Like I'm I'm a little bit older there. I'm finally old enough, mature enough to have kids. <laughs> And hey, I'm finally knowledgeable enough to actually build a good course, <laughs> even though I've been doing it for about 30 years. <laughs> I, I think I'm at that point where I'm starting to feel like it's really coming together. So, and uh, and you folks, you're part of it. You're part of it. You, you've helped me so much. Yeah. Well, thank you. And our last question for this segment is: How do you decide who to collaborate with, um, such as? Dr. Bedard or Dr. Um, Thibodeau? I hope I said that right. Uh, initially, uh, it, it was whoever's w willing to work with me. <laughs> um, right now, Dr. Thibodeau did leave the program. She's become the um, the dean of the Honors College, and it's interesting. We're 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 doing the CSLE plus Cobra and Learner's Mindset in the Honors College, so we're expanding what we're doing in the ADL program with what she's doing. So she hasn't actually left, and she's going to be doing a guest um, session next week on on. Oh, actually, I'm bringing her in to. You'll see her, Colby. Uh, she's coming into the class on Tuesday. On Tuesday, yeah, I, I think I, I think I that's when I have her scheduled because she's going to be talking about applying the principles of the influencer model and 40x to what she's doing like she's every see this is the interesting thing remember we we have the same we aren't going to ask you to do something we don't do ourselves yeah we actually walk the talk so she is going to talk about her her why what and how statement her the influencer model and her wigs and lead and lag measures and so and she's doing that in the honors college Right. So um, it's I think it's going to be exciting. So I, I'm asking your question. I, I work with who uh, ever it, who is willing to work with me. Who do I choose, Dr. Bedard uh, or Dr. Thibodeau? Well, Dr. Bedard um, has preferences and certain likes and certain interests. Dr. Bedard really doesn't like the organizational change course as much as Dr. Thibodeau does. Right. And so uh, but Dr. Bedard, just this podcasting course and all this other stuff. Oh, we were working nonstop like Dr. Bedard's fingerprints are everywhere on this. Right. So and I think I think you're probably finding she's enjoying this, isn't she? Right. Uh, yeah. And you're probably. Yeah. So 
um, I try to find people who are interested in something. So because I can't do every course, I'm working with different adjuncts and I'm finding people who have a passion and interest. And, um, you know, I, I, so certain people like to measure stuff. So, well, guess what? They'll deal with the measurement course. Um, uh, Quentin, uh, who is a uh, part of uh, our, our sort of Blackboard group. He's the director. He, he takes care of Blackboard. He's going to be teaching the online course. Well, he lives it every day, right? He manages, it. He manages the infrastructure. And so he and I have been collaborating on the changes. And the, the 5318, oh, it's going to be so cool. Three modules. You've got a design module, implementation, and then a usability module. It, you're going to have a blast. It's going to be fun. You're going to build an amazing course. And you're going to test it out. And it's really going to be quite good. Um, I have been what you this course this is probably my 10th iteration i've done this course in many other institutions and i like i've refined it refined it refined it refined it refined it like it's getting to the point where i've eliminated a whole bunch of stuff and there's really three key sections and uh, it, it's it's going to be a really practical wonderful application so um it's fun working with quentin you know uh it, it's exciting for him because he's going to be doing it so i'm looking for key adjuncts key faculty who are interested in certain areas and then i'll I'll, I'll sort of I'll build a course I'll work with them and then they sort of take it over and then maintain and massage it and I'll, I'll make sure my fingerprints are there so that there's an overall consistency so I think one of the key things that you're probably seeing overall with the ADL is that everything is does fit together right and, and that is something that I, I think I brought to the ADL program much better than the DLL um, partially because I didn't have to fight with as many administrators <laughs> you know well it's a grad program you have to have this type of a course in it uh well no we'll do the literature review no no you got to do it in a separate course all on about the literature review uh, of global issues uh but that's not really applicable no you have to do <laughs> i got rid of that course anyways so i was able to remove things that i didn't think were beneficial right um and and still i think the the rigor that you folks have um i don't know um uh, are who's you're doing the measurement course right now right action yeah. research there's a lot of work great text, great ideas, you're going to be able to apply that, right? So everything we do, even 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 your research methods course is applicable. Think about that. Most research methods course in grad school are dreadful, but, but I think this one is, is a little bit better, isn't it? It's interesting okay. for me taking it at the same time as 5304. Oh, yes. Yes, because of the organizational change and things. Yeah, interesting. You're interesting. measuring and making um sort of the same types of thinking you have to think backwards and it's it's been really interesting yeah it it is interesting to see this is also another interesting thing in terms of the adl because we have this accelerated option um and then we have probably i'd say two-thirds of people are doing the accelerated option about a third aren't it it, it I, I don't know, maybe it's 50-50. It's a, no, it's a little bit more than half are doing the accelerated option. But those who aren't doing the accelerated option, they're doing things in different sequences than other people. And so the reaction that Colby gives me is different than other people. But seeing how the people who are doing it together, um, guess what? It, in the next two courses, there's going to be the first, you're the first group um, who are going to finish the whole program in one year. A whole graduate degree in one year and you're going to have built an amazing project like and, and look at your e-portfolios how many pages do you have on your e-portfolios how many posts do you have huh a lot, a lot of work <laughs> yeah yeah you've can done I a just, lot you've done amazing. A can i just tell you dr h so in my undergraduate i i got my degree in psychology um and that was a four-year degree but I think I have honestly learned more and developed a better understanding of some of the things that I learned in my undergraduate in the past, what almost, I don't know how long, <laughs> basically the past year in this program with you and then working with Pedro and Colby and Brianna because we all have such different perspectives that it's really been eye opening. And it's hard to believe that that's happened in a year compared to um, what I experienced in my undergraduate, that was four years, but I feel like a lot of that wasn't applicable to my life or what I wanted to pursue or what I wanted to do. And only very few of those courses have really stuck with me where pretty much every course in this program 
has had some kind of impact on my teaching practice or just me as a person. So I think a lot of us could probably say the same. I, I, I'm excited to hear that. Now I've got a question. Why? What, what would you attribute that to? Why, why do you think you've been able to make those connections? Um, I think a big part of it is I have a better understanding of who I am now compared to who I was when I started my undergraduate degree. I think that plays a role in it. Um, I think another part of it is that in my undergraduate, it was a lot of teacher-led instruction, and then you study and take a test. And that was pretty much every class you took. So teacher teaches, you write a paper, you take a test, and then you get a grade. And in this course, especially in that first class, I was terrified. I had no idea what I was doing because I definitely am one of those people that wants the teacher to tell me what to do to get the A, and then I can do it and give it to you and you'll give me an A. And that course was definitely not like that. This whole program is not like that. So it required me to start thinking in a different way and look at how I learn in a different way and even how I teach my own students in a new way. Um, and getting to interact with Colby and Pedro and Brianna, like just added on to that because of how they learn and how they teach and how we interact together as a group. So I think it's really a mix of everything that's happened throughout the ADL program and maybe the accelerated courses, like doing both at the same time, doing the ePortfolio course and having to try to figure all of that out at the same time as I'm trying to figure out, well, what problem is really close to my heart and important to me enough so that like I'd want to do it for a whole year and try to find some solution and figure it out. It's just... I don't know. I don't really have all the words to say. It it's just really opened my mind to a lot of different things. I think part of it too is we are an example of some of those learning theories. We are at the formal operation stage, and we um, we're old enough, and we're we have progressed through our learning to the point where. Um, who is the theorist that talks about assimilation and accommodation? We have, we're at that point now where we have um, the shelves to put the knowledge. Hmm. Actually, mo most of the constructivists will, will uh, talk about that in, in some capacity. Um, the shelves, hmm, that might be, that might be uh, peppered. I'm just trying to um, It's Piaget. Or I thought Piaget, it was Piaget. yeah. But yeah, Fusion and okay. Pepper are the same in my head in a lot of ways. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm glad to hear that you, you've had this capacity to learn and um, you're making the connections. And, and it was a little bit fearful at the beginning. Um, and and um, I, I know it is for a lot of people. Um, you said something that is really important. And, and we're doing this as a group here, that you've learned all these things with your learning community. What, what role do you think that had to play in what we're doing here? Um, and, and the reason I'm, I'm asking that is that this is a significant role in every single one of your courses. Do you think, would, would it be the same? I, I want your opinion on that. No. I really do not think so. I think Pedro, Colby, Brianna, and myself, we all bring something different to the table. And that's why we work so well together. And it's been like that since day one. Um, I was in a different um, core collaboration group at the very start of the program. And although they're both very um, educated individuals and they're, you know, they each have their own strengths, that group and I, we never collaborated and worked together as well as I do with these people. And I don't really know why that is. I've thought about that too. I wonder if it has something to do with Pedro has this like magic way of seeing exactly what you're good at and how you can contribute. And he picked us. He's the one that started this. He's the one that said that we four needed to be together. And, and he was right. And I, he, I mean, there's a lot of things about Pedro that we could all joke about, but that is gold. That's just his gift is bringing people together. And I think Brianna, she's really the one who keeps us all on track. <laughs> Make sure that we get everything done on time and that we're following all the directions and that we're meeting, you know, all the expectations. 
And then Colby's our editor. I'm silly. It, it like even you have a company, right? You can have production, but if you don't have accounting, you need somebody who does the accounting part. You need all those pieces in order to that structure to work. Uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely was, I think everybody kind of picked up in at, at the early stages and, you know, we were able to find a good match. I mean, to be honest with you, it was a matter of like, who wants to do this? Who wants to meet every day? I'm sorry, every week in addition to our classes. That was actually the filtering point. A lot of them started, but none of and them continued. The coming, maybe that was. You were the consistent it. ones, right? And you you show your development, and you show your, your you know your gift by being consistent on the same things you did every every class. So we already knew by second class, like we know Kobe, you know we know Allison's gonna have that checklist, and I know that Brianna already gonna look at all the all the stuff that we need to read and gonna send us all the stuff. Kobe's gonna send us the video of everything we should know. I mean, it was just kind of already laid out. But it was also, you know, because of you. Yeah. Rage. I, I, I want to jump in with something here. And this is a, in another part of the answer to Brianna's question about um, the ADL and development and where we're going next. Um, your experience, I had my eyes open to the power of this type of an experience. Um, a few years back in the, in the DLL program, I had a group who formed, I encourage people to form a group in one of the early courses. They formed a group, they stuck together. There are there were, there were four of them. Um, one gal lost her daughter, 19 year old daughter, um, travesty. Uh, and her group came around her, supported her, encouraged her. She doesn't think she would have been able to finish anything if it wasn't for her group. And I saw that power of that group of collaborators. And, and, I, and I knew that I, I had to formalize that. I had to bring that into the, the, the next iteration of the DLL. I also wanted to mitigate this issue that sometimes I have an adjunct who is doing a course like the measurement course and post one, uh, post, uh, one, one question on the discussions and respond to two, you know, the formula, right? That doesn't work. That doesn't build community. That doesn't build collaboration. So I had to figure out a strategy that would allow um, that I could prevent that misuse of the discussions from happening. Well, guess what? As an adjunct, you can't do that because now you folks do your own evaluation, right? And it changes the, the dynamic. And because I'm responsible and, uh, for teaching the, the early courses, I spent a lot of time making sure students get into a group so that they can come together. Um, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be borrowing this video from you folks. I'm going to be asking you permission to share it with future classes so that they can see the benefit of, of this collaboration. Because um, we don't learn in isolation. We don't. We don't. We, in the real world, we work collaboratively. And, and, and I think you, you, you've talked about the fact that different people do different things, right? Logistics and, and organization and, and picking the right people and, um, you know, discipline, accountability, oh, you know, ideas. What if this, you know, you, you need those different elements. You need the different eyes. You need the different perspectives. And so um, this is something that we wanted to bring into the ADL program. Um, I, I, I am going to let you know that in, in the last course, I'm going to be interviewing you folks because several of you actually did uh, your first course in the old DLL program. I uh, think there's eight students who did their course in the old DLL program, and now they've done the whole program with a different discussion format. So I'm, I'm doing some, I'm going to do an article. If you're interested in participating, I'm doing an article on that to show how building this type of a learning community can make a world of difference. So, and, and again, to answer more of your question, Brianna, this is an ongoing thing. Um, I have other ideas, other courses, that I, other things I want to bring in. And this is in response to um, where you folks are at and what you need and, and, and how, to, how to improve things. So uh, it, it never ends. It, it never ends because learning never ends. Learning never ends and opportunities never end, right? So it's, it's really an opportunity to, to grow and, and to make those adjustments. I live in the state of a perpetual learner's mindset. Challenges, problems, frustrations, oh, opportunity for growth. You know, hmm, what can I do? What can I take away from that? How can I make an adjustment? If I don't do this myself and if I don't model this, well, then how can I expect you folks to do that? I think that's another thing that was important. Earlier on in one of our conversations, we talked about how do we help people to let go of control. 
uh, I think one of the things we have to do is model. I know, Allison, you're doing some really interesting things with uh, portfolios and math. You're going to be modeling stuff, um, and that's important. So uh, this is cool. So I think, I think Brianna, we've, we've, I've answered your questions, and we've also, also gone off on some wonderful tangents, which were, which were great. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, and then uh, I think this is just a good time for our, our second break. And then we're going to move into our last part. 